Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition national webinar. Uh, we have over a thousand people registered and people are coming on at a good clip. So I'm going to give it another minute or so to give more people a chance to get on the line and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's call of the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition. Um, it's certainly a very busy time. I know we have a lot of partners and impacted people in Florida and in Puerto Rico who would like to be with us for this live conversation, but for obvious and certainly understandable reasons aren't able to. We are recording this conversation and we'll make it available afterwards to all who are interested. Uh, and I know keeping the people of Florida and Puerto Rico in our thoughts as they are digging out damage, even as the search and rescue efforts continue in Florida. <clears throat> there were nearly 5 million people that lived in the path that was hit by Hurricane Ian. Uh, several of the hard hit counties have high poverty rates above the national average. There were some of the areas have poverty rates uh, where almost a third of the population is below the poverty line. There were several historically black communities that were hard hit. Um, and in that were hit by Hurricane Ian, there were almost 300,000 households in manufactured housing, obviously highly vulnerable to major storms. Um, and another about 60,000 people, households living in subsidized housing. And Hurricane Ian, of course, comes in the wake of Hurricane Fiona, which impacted Puerto Rico just a couple of weeks ago. And that storm poured 30 inches of rain on the island, destroying or damaging thousands of homes, knocking out power and water service to the entire island. And many, um, many Puerto Ricans are, are still recovering, still reeling from the damage and displacement caused by Hurricane Maria and the very delayed patchwork recovery there. So after the immediate um, response and recovery work is finished, the equally difficult and much longer term work to rebuild will begin in Puerto Rico and Florida, just as it's continuing in Louisiana, Texas, California, Kentucky, and Alaska. At the National Income Housing Coalition, we are committed to working with our state local partners in all impacted communities and with national and other allies to achieve an equitable and complete housing recovery that prioritizes the needs of the lowest income and the most marginalized people, including renters and people experiencing homelessness. NLHC's Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition includes nearly 850 local, state, and national organizations and impacted people many with extensive experience in disaster housing relief, uh, recovery and rebuild, rebuilding efforts, having worked after Hurricane Katrina, Harvey, Maria, Michael, and many other major disasters. So the DHRC has been meeting regularly since the historic storms of 2017 and stands ready to work with the low-income survivors and communities that have been impacted by Hurricanes Fiona and Ian. Our principles for an equitable recovery, which you'll hear about later in the call, will guide our work as we advocate for Congress and the Biden administration to advance our top disaster housing recovery and rebuilding priorities. So I'm really glad today to have um, two people from the Biden administration joining us. You've seen them on the agenda. 
Um, Caitlin Durkovich, who is a special assistant to the president, will be joining, but she'll be joining later on in the call. So I'm pleased now to welcome and in, in turn it over to Jen Jones, who's chief of staff to HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge. I've known Jen since we were at HUD together back in the day <laughs> uh, at, in, in public and Indian housing when she was a, a special advisor, senior advisor to then the assistant secretary for public and Indian affairs. Uh, and now she is chief of staff to HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge. And she's here on her behalf to share some remarks. So Jen, thanks so much for joining us. And I'll turn it over to you. Um, can you hear me? Uh, thanks, Diane. So uh, on behalf of Secretary Fudge, Deputy Secretary Tom, I want to thank you for inviting us to discuss our work around uh, disaster recovery. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit of my uh, remarks on the work that uh, is happening right now in response to Hurricane Fiona, just because we've been in it a little bit longer than we have been in um, on the work around uh, Hurricane Ian that just hit last week. Um, but before I start, I, you know, I have to say, uh, Diane, have, Diane and I have known each other for more than a minute. Um, um, and there's not a day that go to, goes by that the coalition isn't sort of pushing us to do and be better when it comes to meeting the affordable housing needs of millions of Americans. So I just wanna start this off by thanking Diane, thanking the coalition for everything you do. Um, you actually make us uh, better public servants. Um, so uh, as I was thinking about what I wanted to share on today's webinar, I recalled um, in those early days of the administration, one of the very first calls that uh, HUD Secretary, Secretary Fudge made uh, was to the governor of Puerto Rico. Um, they, are, they, they call each other classmates and that they served in Congress together. Um, and during that call, she actually committed to the governor that HUD would be there to support Puerto Rico's recovery for the long haul. Um, uh, she made the governor a promise. Um, and if you know anything about uh, Marsha Fudge, the secretary, you know her word is her bond. Um, and so uh, we have been uh, sort of laser focused on doing everything we can to support uh, the people of Puerto Rico. Um, I think as many of you know, uh, more broadly, HUD has really sort of transformed the way we work in the disaster recovery space. Um, you know, over the last few years, uh, we've changed it in two key ways. One, we're investing deeply in adaptation and resilience planning. Um, and two, uh, which I'm most proud of, we are centering our recovery and resilience around climate justice and racial equity. Um, you know, under Secretary Fudge's leadership, HUD has allocated $5 billion in CDBG DR funds to help communities recover from the 2020 and 2021 storms and build long-term inclusive resilience. Um, more than $2 billion of that total has gone to 10 states, covering 15 separate major disasters in 2020. That includes the wildfires in California, the hurricanes in Louisiana, and the earthquakes in Puerto Rico. Um, another $2 billion has gone to 10 local uh, governments and state governments for 16 major disasters in 2021. Um, and another 720 million has been allocated to five of the 2020 disaster uh, recipients. You know, the, the good news is, is that Congress, um, knowing that this, these, these major storms will continue to happen or, and are getting more and more severe, um, Congress uh, sort of uh, last week in the CR appropriated an additional 2 billion for uh, the 2021 and 2022 disasters. And, you know, our team is working quickly to allocate that funding. Um, so you, you can't really uh, start a discussion about HUD's work, um, especially in Puerto Rico um, and our response to Fiona without touching on um, the administration's reset in early 2021. Um, you know, upon taking office, the administration and Secretary Fudge prioritize action to enable a stronger recovery for Puerto Rico. Um, I think that's something that the president reaffirmed while in Ponce yesterday. Uh, much of our work has centered on freeing up critical disaster recovery resources that have been withheld and offering additional technical assistance to support local efforts. Um, you know, HUD has obligated over $18 billion in disaster recovery funds, um, removed obstacles that prevented Puerto Rico from fully accessing those resources. Um, and taken steps to uh, free up the nearly $2 billion allocated to strengthen the Puerto Rico's electrical grid. 
Uh, all of that is in the last, you know, 18, 19 months. So that's the, that's the resources piece. Um, um, as it relates to Fiona, um, and in response to Fiona, HUD issued a series of, you know, what we call sort of mega waivers um, for our bread and butter program. So that's home, that's the community development block grant program, that's the HOPLA program, that's public housing, FHA, section 184 which offers significant flexibilities to support the use of existing HUD resources uh, for the essentials, food, clothing, water, rent, utilities. Um, it also establishes a 90 day moratorium to prevent mortgage foreclosures. Um, and so, you know, I still like, we're, we're still in that sort of response phase, uh, but as I said, you know, earlier, HUD is, HUD is, you know, the tip of the spear as it relates to disaster recovery. And we're going to be there in Puerto Rico, and we're going to be there um, in Florida, and those that were impacted by Hurricane Ian. Um, so, as I so as I think about um, you know Puerto Rico's long term recovery, you know we've had to ramp up obviously outreach and technical assistance. Um, just this week, I think even today, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research Solomon Green is in Puerto Rico uh, discussing disaster recovery and sustainability. Um, last week, the Deputy Secretary, uh, Adrian Todman, um, our Senior Advisor for Puerto Rico, Rosana Torres, um, you know, our Principal Deputy is in the Secretary for Community Planning and Development, Mary McFadden, um, and our newly hired CPD Senior Advisor for Disaster Recovery, Trey Refit, welcomed Addie Martinez and colleagues from the University of Puerto Rico's Resilience Law Center, offering recommendations and feedback on the ways to strengthen its recovery. Uh, whether that's Maria or earthquakes. Um, in addition, HUD is working closely with Puerto Rico to implement program design changes for its housing and infrastructure programs. Um, you know, more than 20 programs have been launched through Vivienda's Disaster Recovery Action Plan. Um, you know, I'll highlight a few uh, that I'm sure you're all familiar with um, on the Puerto Rico side. Um, one is the R3 program focused on elevated reconstruction for homes in the 100 year floodplain. Um, you know, HUD in Puerto Rico set a goal of uh, 3,000 housing completions by the end of 2021. I'm pleased to share that they've surpassed that goal um, and nearing the goal of at least an additional 2,000 by the end of this year. You know, that number is not small and it represents 5,000 households who are back on their feet, no longer waiting for assistance. Um, now, the pipeline is long. There's still many, many households who have applied for R3 and are still waiting for assistance. And so, you know, I won't consider it a success until those units are completed and protected from hurricane hazards. Um, in addition, there are, I think, currently at least 40 projects building over 6,000 new housing units through the CDBGDR to low income housing tax credit program. Um, additionally, $500 million in CDBG net funding will be used to install renewable, reliable, and resilient energy systems. Um, and you know, the Puerto Rico Department of Housing is using CDBDR funds to help municipalities develop community resilience centers, uh, which will include alternative power and water sources to serve the community in case of an emergency. You know, it's a lot. Um, you know, all of these efforts are designed to not just replace the units that have been lost uh, to these severe um, sort of natural disasters, um, over the last several years, the design to build back sustainably um, and equitably. Um, you know, with the devastating damage that we've seen in Puerto Rico, in Florida, South Carolina, um, you know, HUD is, you know, redoubling our commitment to do everything we can to help these communities uh, recover fully and sustainably. So, so uh, with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to Diane. Jen, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. What an extraordinarily busy time it is right now. And for you to take time out of your schedule and join us is so appreciated. Thank it's really you. heartening to see here, um, to be reminded of what a strong team there is right now at HUD, what an incredibly strong leadership team. Many of the people you mentioned, Solomon Green, Mary McFadden, and certainly your leadership and the leadership of the secretary and the deputy secretary are so needed and appreciated right now. So Thank you for all of your hard work now and in the months and years to come. And we look forward to continued uh, partnership in the work. Beautiful. Thanks, Diane. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for having me here. So we'll turn. Uh,
We'll turn now to our next speaker. Again, we will be hearing from um, somebody from the White House who will be joining us a little later in the call, but now we're gonna move on to hearing updates from disaster impacted communities. And again, here I'm just so grateful for all of the community leaders that have joined us today um, during such an incredibly challenging time to share with us what is happening on the ground, what their needs are, what the challenges are, and how we can work together to advocate to support them in the long recovery ahead. So first, I'm really pleased to welcome back to this call, Ariadna Goudreau Aubert. She's the founder and executive director of Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico. Ariadna, thank you so much for joining. I will turn it over to you. Ariadna, we cannot hear you, so you may still be muted. I know, I think you're joining from your phone, so you may have to unmute yourself. Ariadna, are you there? Well, I can see that you are here, but we can't hear you. Okay, why don't we try to sort out um, if there's something we can do on our end for Ariadna. Certainly she and others in Puerto Rico are, are challenged right now with a lot of um, connectivity and electricity issues related to the disaster. So we will, we will um, hold off on Ariadna and come back to her as soon as possible. And instead, let me see if uh, Marie Ture is available. Marie Ture Padilla Rodriguez is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for Puerto Rico Operations with the Hispanic Federation. Marie Ture, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I, I do want to say that we are, I am having problems with the power and connectivity. Uh, so if something happens, I'm sorry. Um, so thank you for the invitation uh, and um, to the National Low Income Housing Coalition for always being supporting uh, Puerto Rico's recovery. To NOAA, that has been really uh, a great support to our advocacy efforts here in Puerto Rico also. I wanna thank him. And uh, I wanna take my, uh, uh, the people that are here from HUD and, and all the federal agencies. Um, I wanna take the time that I have to make clear ask uh, to, to HUD, and to FEMA uh, that can be elevated and that we need to have that happen now uh, after the Fiona disaster. Um, first, uh, I know HUD has been working to flex to give more flexibility in the requirements and ways that the people in Puerto Rico can access the aid uh, of the of, of, of the agency. Uh, but there's something that is really a huge barrier for local uh, community and nonprofit organizations that are the first responders after an emergency, and that's the reimbursements and matching fund requirements. We know there's a temporary a waiver on that, uh, that the president announced. But we think that in terms of Puerto Rico context, uh, if you really want uh, first uh, the, the, the local organizations and local community, communities to be able to engage in the programs and be part of the recovery and have a more and you know, get the bottleneck out of the recovery, we need those type of barriers to be waived permanently, the reimbursement and matching requirements. Also important, um, a Hispanic Federation has been providing supplies around the impacted communities, and we have seen a lot of people that are, are living in blue tarps since Hurricane Maria and the earthquakes. So even though the R3 program is trying to address as much as possible, um, it is unacceptable that this uh, blue tar, the, the blue tar situation that we are seeing uh, in the impacted community. So if, if somehow HUD with the Puerto Rico Housing Department can act more immediately uh, with those survivors that are, are had to face Fiona on the blue tarp, uh, that should be a priority. Um, Another important element that that needs to be considered is that HUD has an opportunity 
to impact the energy grid in Puerto Rico with the $1.9 billion that have been allocated uh, to the energy grid, CDBGDR funds that have been allocated for our energy grid. Um, with Fiona, Hispanic Federation installs, so, uh, before Fiona, the Hispanic Federation installs solar equipment in fisheries like uh, in Nahuabo, and we have seen that it works. Rooftop solar works. Um, the fisheries are working. They didn't lose their product. They 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 help the community with their medicine and to recharge equipment like energy o oasis in the communities. So we urge HUD and the Puerto Rico Housing Department to use the energy funding that they have to truly uh, deploy res energy resiliency with rooftop solar. Um, another important request is that in the allocation notice that that it's probably coming after Fiona, we need more public participation uh, requirements. We need the Citizen Advisory Committee to be a reality in Puerto Rico for the recovery and to be a, a requirement for the federal agency that uh, that type of public participation uh, space is effective and, and, and needs to be created, not only for CDBG, uh, CDBG meet. Um, if there's a question about what is this uh, a citizen advisory committee, I can talk more about it. But basically, it's a space where the the, the space where it we it is supposed to have voices of the community, the third sector, and other stakeholders to make the to ensure the effective use of the federal funding. That committee committee has not been officially created, and we has been asking for it in Puerto Rico since uh, 2018. So we hope that it is created and also for the allocation and notice of Fiona, it is included. Um, that's regarding HUD. Um, regarding FEMA, I wanna raise the, the, uh, the concern that when you call to the 1-800 number to fill out the individual assistance application for, uh, for the survivors, the waiting time is 380 and 58 minutes approximately. I have the video I called. Um, when you have communities without power that they don't have a battery for the cell phone, you are you, FEMA cannot be expecting that they, they are going to wait 358 minutes in line to, 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 to fill the application. That's unacceptable. The other thing that we need urgently is uh, that the case manager and the inspectors from the individual assistant of FEMA needs to, to be uh, capacitated uh, employees that first either are bilingual or has have translator. Uh, we need uh, the survivors in Puerto Rico to understand what is happening with, with the aid. Um, also, we already know that, for example, there are a lot of flyers that give inform from FEMA that is giving information on how to prove ownership and occupancy. And even though they're talking about the alternative document that you don't need a deed or a formal title, title to get the aid and that you can present alternative documentation, those flyers and information are not uh, explaining to the survivors that now the individual assisted guidelines allows for uh, uh, a, a statement of the survivor of, of why they have a property interest in that house to get access to the FEMA aid. So we need the case managers and uh, inspectors and, uh, and the information that FEMA is giving to the survivors to, to provide that alternative that they have if, if the documents are not if they don't have the documents to present and prove their, their occupancy and ownership. Um, also, yes, uh, the major disaster declaration that was made, it, it had a lot of amendments to get the 78 municipalities within the major disaster declaration. So the, the periods or the timelines to apply for FEMA are different uh, between among municipalities. And we think that's not good for the for the people because there are too many deadlines. So we think FEMA should just uh, you know make an extension up to the latest deadline so that everybody has most the most time possible to apply. Um, we also think that, as I said before, there's a lot of people that are living in blue tarps or you know on 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 uh, secure uh, housing since Maria and the earthquake. 
And a lot of the applications uh, were denied by FEMA because of title issues that now the public policy changed. So we think that during this process, they need to reopen those cases and give the opportunity to those people to get the Maria aid and the earthquake aid that they were denied or unfairly. Um, important, uh, I, uh, we need uh, a, an educational campaign. The application uh, has needs to be filed online uh, and, and the process, even though it's a, can, it's more friendly than the previous one. Still, FEMA needs to go out and explain people how to fill this documentation, maybe in the news, in Spanish, in the radio, so that people understand the process, making uh, videos in Spanish with like uh, section by section of the application. I think that doesn't exist and needs to be created. Um, another ask is that if a person has a loan from previous disaster and they lost their home now with Fiona, we are asking for the loan forgiveness uh, of the uh, of the forgiveness of, of those loans. Um, and finally, I want to mention that definitely technical assistance was mentioned before. Technical assistance to municipality and nonprofits so that they can uh, uh, help people accessing the aid and also to access themselves as, as institutions, uh, the, the, federal, the federal funding. Um, I hope I didn't talk too, too quickly. I was trying to present all the ask I wanted to present. So if there's any question, I'm more than welcome to, to, to answer. Yeah, thank you, Marie Therese. No, that was just that was just right, and I appreciate how specific and concrete all of your requests are. I do see that we have uh, a good number of staff from Capitol Hill, from key Senate and um, representative offices, as well as from the administration on the line, and I'm sure they're. I hope they're taking really good notes. I will say that. Uh, the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition, you know, we take our lead from local impacted organizations and people on what the priorities should be. And so towards the end of the call, you'll, we'll, we'll show via slides many of these same priorities that Marie Tre um, just laid out. So um, uh, Marie Tre, there was a question about, um, there was a question about people with disabilities. Can you speak to how people with disabilities on Puerto Rico have been impacted by Fiona and what specific uh, recommendations or needs they have? Oh yeah, the elderly and the disabled are, are in the worst situation because there's extreme poverty in Puerto Rico. When you combine all uh, the, the, the disability, the elderly situation and the extreme poverty without power, they are in critical need of help. And these are people that cannot go to, you know, they don't have cell phones to call to FEMA. They cannot go to a to centers. Um, um, and and we have we have been visiting and uh, trying. Uh, we have provide uh, some supplies to this type of community. But one thing that 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 we think is that this population are, are um, has a disproportionate burden during this process. And one of the things that we have been asking to the federal government, uh, the Biden administration and Congress is to, is to provide the SSI, uh, uh, the SSI benefits to this community. SSI is supposed uh, to give around $800 to the elderly, disabled and blind people. But the federal, the Social Security Administration denied this benefit to the disabled and elderly in Puerto Rico, the U.S. citizens that live in Puerto Rico, just because they live in Puerto Rico. And the Supreme Court recent, last year validated that discrimination against, against this vulnerable population in Puerto Rico in the Valle Madero case. But still, the Congress has the discretion to give to give access. To, to the elderly and disabled in Puerto Rico to the SSI benefits so that they can confront this type of situation. And also I think FEMA should create somehow a service to help them apply for the aid because if they cannot move, they cannot, you know, uh, they, or, or they don't have, we have a lot of uh, issues of broadband access, uh, digital divide. 
So not everybody in Puerto Rico has internet, cell phones, you know, that we need uh, uh, the responders to understand that reality. Okay, thank you so much, Marie Ture. I really appreciate you joining this call again during such a difficult and hectic time. And we'll certainly have you back in the future and continue to work with you on all of the priorities that you laid out. Thank you for joining us. So we are still um, expecting Ariadna from Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico to join, but she's not uh, with us yet. So we're gonna move now to Florida and hear about impacts and needs from Hurricane Ian. And we'll start with Kathy Grunwald, Grunwald, who's the disaster coordinator attorney uh, from Legal Services of North Florida. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for asking me to be here to talk about um, Hurricane Ian, um, which um, just um, made landfall in Florida less than a week ago, about six days ago. Um, and a part of my um, position as the disaster coordinator attorney is also to want, run our statewide uh, disaster practice group. And then during activation, um, I'm on the state EOC's uh, mass care calls and I'm able to keep up um, the activities uh, that the state is um, participating in and um, getting going um, after the hurricane, well, before the hurricane and afterwards. And right now, um, I can update you on the um, a number of FEMA um, individual assistance applications so far that we have in Florida. Well, first of all, we've had, um, as of this morning or late last night, two additional uh, counties were designated for individual assistance. And so we have a total of 19 counties in Florida um, designated for individual assistance. And the, um, probably the most impacted counties are those uh, along the coast here in Southwest Florida. We have um, yesterday or today, a total of um, 160,000 applications um, already submitted for FEMA individual attend, um, assistance. Um, and according to FEMA documents, uh, so far, a little less than 300 have been approved. And so um, we haven't um, had uh, much experience at this point from Hurricane Ian as to what's happening, happening with FEMA's, um, um, with folks FEMA's applications. Um, I do know in that part of Florida, there uh, are a lot of mobile homes. And if you've been able to see the pictures uh, on TV or um, on the internet, that you'll notice that many mobile home parks were um, just completely destroyed. A lot of those mobile homes are um, folks living in them are our clients, poor, poor and vulnerable populations. Many of them um, do not have insurance, um, so they will be relying completely on FEMA assistance um, to get um, uh, to start over. Um, um, some of them have insurance, but many of them will not have insurance for the additional insurance for peril of a windstorm during a hurricane. So although they felt they were covered by insurance, they are going to get nothing from the insurance company because um, insurance company has determined that of course the, um, the peril of the windstorm during the disaster um, is what uh, caused all their damage. So as I said, again, they'll be relying um, totally on um, um, assistance from FEMA, and perhaps later on um, with um, CDBGDR money. But as we know from our experience, and many of you know from your experience, that's a long way down the road. Um, and so uh, with Hurricane Michael, it was more than two years before that program was opened in Florida. Um, hopefully it won't be that long um, this time. But the other um, um, stumbling block for recovery is that many people are living in um, on family property or um, if they're living in a mobile home, it's just been passed down. They don't have clear title 
um, to the mobile home or to the property. And so uh, at Legal Services and other organizations throughout the state, uh, we'll be trying to clear the title to uh, lots of people's property. And uh, from experience, um, we know sometimes we're dealing with several generations um, and that can take um, many years. And so um, <clears throat> we're looking at, uh, in the true sense of the word, long-term recovery for many of the folks that are experienced or have experienced Hurricane Ian. Um, in Florida, Today, we just opened up our first, uh, or FEMA just opened up their first disaster recovery center, um, unless one has opened up in the last few hours. That was in um, heavily impacted county, Lee County. Um, they plan to, of course, open up more of those, and I expect probably in the next few days that will happen. Legal services and legal aid um, organizations in um, that area will be in those um, um, disaster recovery centers, um, talking to clients and assisting them with FEMA applications. Uh, already, we have people who have... Um, We'll be needing um, to appeal the FEMA decisions. So we'll be helping people with their FEMA appeals. Um, and so that'll be uh, coming up. Um, and as I said, um, uh, let's see. We have also, um, the state has opened, well, they said they were gonna open up two um, insurance villages, uh, which they did in Hurricane Michael later on after the uh, disaster. Um, and at that point, people would go to the insurance village and they would be able to talk to people from the insurance companies about their claim. And they were encouraged to uh, try to settle those claims. So um, yesterday, those were called insurance villages. Uh, today, they're being called uh, initial payment center. Um, so that may be the name change, maybe because um, it's a better explanation of what's going on. Um, and right now we have one of those um, in initial payment centers, um, and that is uh, in Port Charlotte in Florida, which is Charlotte County, which was another one of our heavily um, impacted um, counties here in Florida. We've opened up um, disaster unemployment assistance. Uh, so those people who have lost their job or unable to go to their job or self-employed and can't work because of the disaster can now um, go ahead and apply for disaster unemployment. And our state um, Department of Families and, and Children and Families has applied for um, disaster SNAP and indicated that there's a very good chance that um, we'll be receiving that in Florida. And um, uh, you may remember that in the past uh, where we had disaster SNAP with Hurricane Irma, we had extremely long lines and it was hot in Florida. Um, uh, this year, um, I believe they're going to be able to start uh, making the applications um, telephonically um, without having to go to a, a site, at least initially, um, to get that. And um, we still have a number, I believe, at 19 shelters open. Um, five of those are special needs shelters. Um, a lot of people will be needing a place to go and live. Um, and that's going to be difficult to find in that area of Florida. Um, so we'll be waiting to see um, how that happens and how legal services programs down here um, can respond to that. And that's what I have. Um, I know we'll know more as each day goes by and as each week goes by. And we are ready for, um, we are here for the long haul. Absolutely. And we are as well. Thank you, Kathy, for those updates. I do have one question for you. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but you mentioned the, the mobile home residents who are folks that you have been working with for a long time, who are um, very low income, who've lost their homes, have no insurance, will rely on FEMA um, entirely. What, what, where are they now? And what are the prospects for their short and medium term housing support? Now, many of them are living with family or friends um, and have had to move away from their, um, you know, their home, of course. Um, many of them are in shelters. Um, 
the people who lived in mobile homes were advised um, to evacuate um, from their mobile home park to someplace else. Um, there are the long-term prospects, maybe even the short-term prospects are grim. You know, they will be looking for um, housing from FEMA um, temporarily. Um, and after that, um, the housing outlook in Florida, like all over the country um, for affordable housing is grim. So it's, it's gonna be very difficult. Um, and I know, um, People in the past think that uh, you know living in a mobile home is somewhat affordable, but um, they're not as inexpensive as one might think, and uh, very difficult to obtain um, for a lot of uh, poor um, Floridians. Okay, thanks very much for sharing that as well, Kathy. I appreciate you joining and all of your work and leadership. And we look forward to continuing to work with you towards all of the needs in Florida. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And we're gonna stick with um, updates from Florida on Hurricane Ian. And we'll hear next from Gladys Cook, who is the Resilience and Recovery Director from the Florida Housing Coalition. Gladys, I'm so glad you're able to join us. I know you're incredibly busy and on the road right now. So thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over yes. to you. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Kathy, because you gave such a, a broad and comprehensive picture of currently what's going on. So I'll just add a little bit to what we're doing. Um, we're the technical assistance provider for Florida Housing Finance Corporation. So we work with our state housing trust fund communities and um, there's about 28 of them in the um, 19 now declared counties. And so we've been digging out their um, housing assistance plans to kind of get a preview of where they might be able to um, use their funds toward emergency repair and then long-term recovery. The, the state um, has a $5 million set aside that they activate with trust funds and then they, they'll divvy that out in the next month or so. So it's additional money. It's the State Housing Initiatives Partnership SHIP funds. And so um, now that there's so many declared counties and uh, municipalities, that money will get smaller and smaller for each local government, but it is additional funding. But the thing with the SHIP program is you can convert your existing program dollars for purchase assistance and things like that right over to emergency assistance. Um, and um, the SHIP program is not um, made to deal with manufactured and mobile homes. You can only spend 20% of the funds on any kind of uh, repairs on those, but you can ask for a waiver to um, use funds to repair uh, mobile and manufactured homes. And we pulled some numbers on the number of mobile home parks in the declared counties, um, and there's 1,107 mobile home parks in, in that's in most of the counties, we just got up to 17 because they just added the two, but th that means there's 158,000 lots um, that have these. And these aren't manufactured home communities. They're not campgrounds. They're the old trailer parks that that um, were really transitory. They're very high density. And then they have these older, older units. And so we've been encouraging all along that those older units be replaced, at least with modern manufactured housing. But I think that the theme of this disaster, like Kathy was saying, is going to be um, with these mobile homes. And so back to the, the ship funding, um, communities can get a waiver to work with those um, residents. Um, but a lot of the, these plans that we've looked at, they require that the applicants first apply to FEMA um, and or use their insurance proceeds before they receive SHIP. And so SHIP turns out to not be the first line of defense for most of these local governments. So we're going to be talking to those local governments about making the SHIP funds uh, more immediate. Um, some of them allow for home repairs only. Um, uh, so um, we're going to talk to them about um, using funds in their disaster strategy so that they can be more flexible. Um, so some of the uh, counties um, have a deferred loan that's forgivable rather than grants. And you know when you have these emergencies, it's best to just make them grants only. Um, a good number of those have funding for rental assistance and relocation expenses. So that will be very helpful. 
Um, and some of those funds can even use, be used by uh, beneficiaries to, to find housing in another county. So if they have to stay in a hotel across the line, then that's helpful. Um, so um, there's a lot of priorities um, that are kind of all over the place about first qualified, first served basis. Um, we're going to be helping those um, ship administrators to be organized to work with the, um, the emergency operations centers, the relief centers that Kathy mentioned that are opening. Um, so that's kind of where we're looking with the mobile home part of this. Um, we also are working with the assisted housing inventory. Um, and that, those are anything with tax credits, um, public housing, um, USDA funded. And um, there's about a thousand of those properties with 107,000 units. Um, so we'll be getting those reports soon. It's real soon right now. I mean, we're still in the rescue phase, so um, it's hard to get real numbers on the damage assessments, but I'm told that some of the damage assessments should be done this week. Um, so then we'll, we'll know more, but um, the Florida Housing Coalition was asked to be co-chair um, of the State Disaster Housing Task Force, and so that's with the uh, Florida Division of Emergency Management. So um, we're really excited to be able to be um, in the front uh, with that um, task force when it starts up again. And Kathy mentioned the air's title uh, issues, and we've been working on that as well. And so we're going to be expanding our methodology into these counties so that we can help local governments identify the clusters uh, where air title issues happen uh, so that we can make sure that those um, residents aren't disenfranchised from assistance. So we'll continue um, to do our outreach and messaging to our housing providers. Um, we also will be advocating that when the, the federal funds, the CDBGDR funds are allocated that um, they get on a much faster track than Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Michael. Um, and so that we can get that those funds out um, sooner. We have 121 local governments in Florida that already have housing offices and they're perfectly capable to use those uh, and they're ready to do that. So we're gonna be advocating for that. So um, that's what I have today. And um, thank you so much for um, having us on. Thank you, Gladys. There's, there's a couple of questions that come from Michelle Smith asking about um, one, whether and how impoverished residents in ho mobile homes were evacuated prior to the disaster. And she's also asking about what types of facilities are being used as shelters. Well, I know Kathy might have a little more on that, but I just learned that there were four shelters in Charlotte County that were flooded. And so they were moving those residents to a, a shelter that's kind of east in the rural part of the county and, and it wasn't heavily populated yet. So I do think there's a sheltering problem in general because of the flooding. Um, and then the, the mobile home residents, um, I mean, they're like everyone else with the, um, the prospect of um, where do you go when you have these warnings and, and we know that in Lee County, they're asking, well, why didn't you evacuate sooner? And I don't think there's a flaw in the system that they did the best they could, um, but Kathy might have more information on specifically where those um, mobile home residents ended up. Okay, it looks like, I think Kathy, oh, there she is, okay. Here. Yeah, yeah, I can um, just, uh, I know that most of the shelters, many of the shelters are in schools in Florida. So um, that's where they would have ended up. Um, and um, um, on the evacuation, uh, they were, um, there were evacuation, um, first voluntary and then mandatory evacuations. And then um, uh, people with special needs uh, could get assistance getting to the shelter that took the special needs. Uh, the other folks would, um, um, you know, have to get, uh, take themselves there or have some other uh, family or friend get them to the shelter. Okay, thanks for that, Kathy and Gladys. And again, thank you both so much for all of your work and thanks for joining today. Thank you. Okay, we are gonna go back now to hear from one more speaker from Puerto Rico. We'll hear from Ariadna Gadro Obear, who is the founder and executive director of Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico. <clears throat> Ariadna, I know how busy you are, and you're also 
literally on the road, or it looks like you just got off the road. So thank you so much for joining. I'll turn it over to you. No, I, I wanted to say how grateful um, I am for this chance of, and for the continued support of the National Low Income Housing Coalition to Puerto Rico and to stakeholders on the ground. As Diane was saying, today has been an, a hectic day uh, amidst two hectic uh, weeks after uh, the impact of Fiona in the island. Today, we had a chance to have a meeting with both HUD and uh, Puerto Rico Department of Housing officials, and we were also uh, at a brigade or community legal clinic in Loisa. So basically what I wanted to report was uh, just like a little bit about what's going on with the FEMA applications. I don't know, I don't wanna repeat things that maybe have been already said, but in Puerto Rico after Maria, we saw uh, Hurricane Maria that was a, a category four hurricane. Uh, we had nearly 1.1 million applications to FEMA. Um, at this moment, after Fiona, that has catastrophic floodings, but was a category one hurricane, we're seeing a huge number of 775,000 applications for the IHP program. Um, Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico has been uh, working, uh, training volunteers on the ground on FEMA processes, but also providing legal support to survivors around the island. And uh, we are a little bit concerned about what we're seeing on the ground. While it's still very early in the process to say that the statistics that are coming in from FEMA very slowly uh, are telling about denials rates or are telling about uh, what's happening with the title issue of somebody was saying, was mentioning before, uh, before, uh, before me. Um, I need to mention that um, a lot of people in the communities are reporting denials based on lack of verified ownership. As you all know, this was a huge obstacle for the recovery of people in the island after Hurricane Maria, since half the people in Puerto Rico lack a formal title. Um, we thought that after uh, the memo FEMA put out in September 2, 2021, like establishing the guidelines for that uh, self-declaration for informal owners, that things were going to be a little bit more flexible. But on the ground, we are not only seeing those denials, but also we're seeing female officials who lack any kind of knowledge about uh, what's happening with the, with the informal title uh, and how can people like prove ownership. And also we're seeing uh, female officials demanding that people have their documents notarized, which in Puerto Rico means having access to a specialized lawyer who can be the only person that's a notary in Puerto Rico. Um, we are also a little bit concerned about the fact that when people have to call FEMA uh, because of duplication of applications or because of any technical issue or because they're trying to apply via phone, they are uh, they face a, a wait time of more than 350 minutes. And I'm talking about having assistance in Spanish. Um, for us in Puerto Rico, which is an, an, an LEP jurisdiction and knowing that these were the same barriers that we faced in 2017, we are concerned about the fact about how will, will that kind of uh, barriers um, hinder uh, equitable access to recovery. Remember that in Puerto Rico, communications and power are still unstable in many jurisdictions, and we're like very concerned about this. FEMA opened nine disaster relief centers around the island. We think this is not enough, considering also that in Puerto Rico, people lack public transportation and that transportation needs to be um, ensured so that elders and people with other mobility uh, uh, challenges can uh, uh, visit the DRCs and be finally able to file uh, for their application. On the ground right now, what we're seeing uh, is a lot of, of misinformation regarding critical needs assistance. I know this is something that the National Low Income Housing Coalition has been trying to get clarified with FEMA, but uh, there has been like a lot of misinformation about what is the critical needs assistance for, who can apply for it. Uh, is that the only benefit that people will get on the FEMA? So we are still expecting uh, FEMA uh, answers regarding um, who is eligible for the $700, what will happen to people who are deemed ineligible for the $700 once they received it. 
So we have a lot of questions you know, about what's happening on the ground. And we think that the misinformation regarding the fact that people think that everyone should um, has automatic access to the critical needs assistance um, is what's making numbers like uh, increase and increase. Uh, yesterday, President Biden had a very quick visit to Puerto Rico, and among other stuff, he promised uh, that the recovery process regarding CDBGDR and CDBGMIT uh, is going to be accelerated. We don't know what that means uh, um, at this moment, but, but, but we know that HUD uh, approved a super waiver basically permitting that a lot of the funds that are being channeled to Puerto Rico can also be used for uh, to Fiona. Yet, uh, major programs such as CDBG DR and CDBG MIT were not included in that waiver. So we're also waiting uh, to see uh, then what will the benefit of that waiver look like um, and uh, who can access more funding. Uh, on behalf of Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico, we're continuing advocacy efforts. Uh, we think this is the moment, as many of you think, after Ian uh, to reform this system that is very, very, very broken and that is fundamentally uh, uh, a program that discriminates against uh, low-income people, but also against uh, people of color, uh, not only in Puerto Rico, but in other jurisdictions. And I also wanted to use like, uh, like the final seconds of this time, uh, just to say that we are able and we're willing and we're interested in providing any kind of support. And that includes uh, webinars, trainings for free, um, documents, models that we have created regarding FEMA and recovery processes in both English and Spanish for people who are working uh, with housing advocacy or with legal support uh, in Florida after Ian or elsewhere, particularly in what has to do with uh, informal ownership, because that's something that we have worked with uh, for the past five years. And even when the story is repeating itself, um, we think that we have learned something that maybe we can share with others who, who need this help. So Diane, Noah, thank you for the space. Thank you so much, Ariadna. I did want to ask, um, you mentioned and we talked about a little bit earlier about the issue of air properties. And of course, together we, we um, were successful in getting FEMA to begin to accept alternative documents. What have you seen so far in terms of how well is FEMA doing in letting people know that these other types of documents will be acceptable for, for assistance? It's quite horrible because the thing is that if you don't have access to the September memo, um, if you don't have access to that kind of information, basically if you're not a lawyer, uh, what's gonna happen is that, is that you don't even know that a declarative statement is possible. You know, using the outreach of organizations as Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico, which is an independent non-LSE program, it's like very difficult to get people to know. And also it's the duty of FEMA to tell people. So we're asking FEMA to at least uh, place a copy or model uh, in the disaster relief centers. But this is something that is not happening. And we're already receiving complaints about inspectors uh, refusing to accept documentation that is not a formal title. So we're back in 2017 in that sense. Okay, well, thanks for that update and clearly a lot more that will, lot of pressure that we'll need to put um, on FEMA to make sure that they get it right this time. Ariadna, thank you so much for all your hard work and leadership. Thanks for joining today. Take care. All right, now we are joined uh, by Caitlin Jerkovich, who is a special assistant to President Biden. And she's a senior director for resilience and response with the National Security Council. Caitlin, I'm really grateful for you joining on such a, during such a busy time. Um, and I will turn it over to you for your remarks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Diane, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, all of those members of the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition who are focused on ensuring that we are driving um, equitable response and recovery into the communities uh, that need it most. I am really honored to, to have been invited to speak with all of you today. This is obviously a very timely conversation uh, as we are in the early stages of recovery in Puerto Rico from Hurricane Fiona and really still in the midst of responding to Hurricane um, Ian. And I've had an opportunity as I've been sitting here working on the president's trip to Florida 
tomorrow to listen to some of the conversation. And I understand, I mean, you all are very aware of how acute and tragic um, the situation is on the ground. Um, the president very much takes his role as consoler in chief um, uh, seriously, but also understands that the federal government has significant direct federal assistance that it can bring to communities um, in their greatest time of need. He has traveled to dozens of communities impacted um, by disasters uh, from California to Louisiana to Kentucky twice in less than a year. Uh, yesterday he was in Puerto Rico uh, uh, and tomorrow he will travel to Florida to meet uh, survivors and to underscore his commitment to ensuring uh, that he is helping and driving and leaning in to the federal response and ensuring that communities have the support that they need to recover, both in the short term and the long term. Um, he's been on the ground and he's seen firsthand not only the devastation, but um, how the federal government currently supports the kind of uh, mid to long term recovery of communities. And I want to emphasize that he knows that we can do better and has placed a priority on re envisioning how the federal government supports. Um, communities that have just gone through a disaster of, of the proportion of Hurricane Ian or, or Fiona. And in fact, um, I just came from a meeting where we were talking about what he would say tomorrow to the people of Lee County, of, of Port Meyer, and, and the challenge that this is just, there's a very long process ahead. And when you are a survivor and you are looking at your lot and there is nothing left, um, it's a it's a very hard thing to um, you know to to be positive about what the the future holds. But we have learned time and time again, really, the resilience of of American communities across this um, country. I know that there are uh, a number of displaced uh, of, of disaster survivors on today's call. Um, I know that you are attempting to navigate what are cumbersome and bureaucratic processes, um, programs in the federal government that are siloed, um, and systems and materials that are um, difficult to absorb and to understand. Uh, they're hard for me <laughs> to, un uh, to, to read, much less are they oriented to survivors who may have lost all of their worldly possessions. Um, may not have a phone or have the infrastructure to connect the phone to, um, you know, the mobile infrastructure. They may not have housing, um, things that we take for granted. Uh, we are working to address these challenges. You've heard um, a little bit about what we've done, for example, uh, on the, um, the demonstrating property ownership, uh, but that's just a small piece in the bigger picture. And uh, we, we are aware that much more needs to be done. Um, it is going to take time, and I think time is, is not uh, a luxury that we have, but comprehensive reforms um, do you know, require a whole of government effort. And so while we are looking at how we rethink long-term community recovery and try to streamline all of the various federal assistance programs, provide um, counties and localities with the capacity that they need to think about long-term planning, how to leverage all this funding. There is a lot that can be done in the near term uh, to improve community recovery. As I said, this is a priority for the president. We are working across the federal interagency to look at those near-term actions that we can take today to improve how we are providing um, uh, coordination of federal support, and it's why it's so important that we hear um, from you, from survivors, uh, so what we're doing now can be responsive to um, your needs. I want to address a couple of the things that I heard uh, as I joined, but I, I do want to say that we um, have uh, are in the process of executing on a whole-of-government effort called Recovering from a Disaster Life Experience where we are trying to, not trying, we are working to improve 
how disaster survivors interact with the federal um, uh, support system. And that means uh, everything from making the materials easier to read and understand so there is not misinformation and um, we minimize the amount of misunderstanding uh, and confusion. It is creating a single entry point uh, for disaster survivors so they only have to really provide their information once and that we then make it available to the, the various different federal agencies that can provide support, mainly FEMA, the Small Business Administration, HUD, and the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture. Um, and we are looking at it through the lens of not just um, households and individuals, but also small, small businesses. Uh, so this is focused on survivors, and then we've got a longer term kind of how do we help communities um, recover. I wanted to speak to a couple of things that I heard, and I think that this was Diane, or someone may have raised this in response to what we're hearing in Puerto Rico. Um, we do understand um, the, the need to uh, provide the documents that demonstrate property ownership can be onerous. Um, and this was a priority early on in the administration. And FEMA has been accepting alternative documents to property deeds uh, to demonstrate uh, ownership. I hear um, you that this has uh, not been yet fully implemented, and we will take that back to FEMA. Uh, and, and let them know that. Uh, and we also, I think, need to work, um, as, as uh, Mayor Tree said, with the Hispanic Federation regarding the change in FEMA's policy since requests for assistance were made following Maria and the earthquake, and this is something uh, that we will follow up on. Um, I am aware that we also have to work to continue to make sure that inspectors are fully witting of all of these changes. You are not the first to say that they don't understand this, aren't accepting the policy changes. We've heard this in Kentucky and other places. That contract is in the process of being renewed. And I know that the FEMA administrator is interested in ensuring that there is accountability and that these changes are being driven um, you know, it, it to, to meet people where they are. But again, I will note that concern um, with FEMA. I also want to make sure that everybody on this call has visibility about the Small Business Administration's Low Interest Disaster Loan Program. Um, because it is administered by the Small Business Administration, there is often a misconception that this program is only available to small businesses. That is not the case. Uh, the SBA program also provides low interest disaster loans to homeowners and to individuals. Now, you do have to have a certain credit, credit weather, uh, worthiness, but it can be helpful for people who are underinsured or don't have uh, insurance, both at the individual and at the small business um, level. Um, you know, I will just close by saying we know that, that we, this is a challenge that we have to tackle. The president has made it clear that we are going to tackle it. He asks every time uh, that we go into a, a community that, that uh, has been devastated by disasters, the progress that we're making, what we're doing. So we have something more uh, reassuring to tell survivors. Uh, and so uh, it is, we're laser focused on it, but we need to continue to hear feedback. We think we're making changes. If you're not seeing them on the ground, uh, it's important for us to know that so we can facilitate that with the programs uh, and continue to make improvements. And so with that, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm happy to take a question or two. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I really appreciate your accessibility and your um, your willingness to really listen and engage in this way. And I appreciated all of your comments and sharing of resources. And I think probably most heartening for all of us on this call was to hear your and President Biden's commitment to re-envisioning, as you put it, um, disaster response so that it better need, meets the needs of marginalized and other low and low income and uh, other marginalized people because that is so badly needed and something that we have been working on together um, 
for so long. So we certainly have a lot of ideas and recommendations in that space and would love to continue to have this conversation um, this conversation with you. There are um, a couple of questions that many of which we can follow up with you in those future conversations. But one question that I did want to ask you here relates to um, information. You, you talked about breaking down silos and how important that is, and we couldn't agree more. Um, so the question is about efforts to improve information sharing between FEMA and HUD. Um, what Margaret Adams says is grantees need access to FEMA's application data quickly so they can conduct needs assessment for CDBGDR. Um, and I would expand that question too to ask about how FEMA and HUD intend to work together to stand up programs like the Disaster Housing Assistance Program or DASH to meet some of the shorter and medium term housing needs of folks like those in the mobile home parks that were destroyed and beyond. So um, thank you for that question. And I just want to begin by saying we would certainly invite, we, we welcome an opportunity to sit down and have a, a more robust conversation with you uh, and to get your additional insights and feedback. Jennifer DeCesaro on my team, um, she's the director for mitigation and recovery, is leading um, uh, this effort and very focused on equitable recovery and will work um, with you to facilitate um, a continued uh, conversation on this front. Part of the objective of the recovering from a disaster life experience is to ensure that FEMA, SBA, HUD, and USDA are um, doing a better job of sharing information. Uh, we run into privacy issues and other things that we're trying to sort through, um, but creating kind of a common integrated picture about an individual is what we're trying to get to. It's just like everything in the federal government, never as easy as you think um, it's going to be. I know related just to what we can do in the short term before there's a CDV GDR, Deanne has stood up a Criswell, a specialized housing task force that is made up of SBA, HUD, those on the ground in the state, um, understanding that, that many of those displaced survivors were in manufactured homes, mobile homes, and that we need to speed um, housing assistance to them. I believe that today FEMA is going to um, approve transition, transition sheltering assistance. I think I have that acronym right, transitional sheltering assistance which means that we can move people out of congregate shelters and get them into hotels and Airbnbs and other things and the federal government pays um, for that uh, while thinking about how do we quickly, uh, you know, work to, to restock and get stronger, more resilient manufactured home units into these areas. I hope that answers your question. It does in part, especially especially the, the invitation to sit down and talk about it more in depth, which I welcome. Would love to talk more about the TSA program, some of the challenges that that program presents for some of the lowest income people uh, and some of our suggested solutions. So again, I really appreciate Caitlin. Um, very grateful for your willingness to join the call. Really appreciate your remarks and your commitment and the commitment from the president. Uh, and look forward to continued conversation with you, uh, Jennifer, and, and others of your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we will turn back to one last um, update from a disaster impacted community. And we are fortunate to have Adrian Bush on the line to share with us updates from Kentucky. Um, of course, that Kentucky, the disaster was before Fiona, before Ian, over the summer when there was major flooding and tornadoes, um, and they are still working to recover with a lot of remaining needs. So Adrian Bush is the executive director of the Homeless and Housing Coalition of Kentucky and here to tell us more. So Adrian, thanks so much for joining. I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Diane, for, for hosting this call today. It um, is incredibly important. So on July 27th, I got a phone call from my child. Um, it, she had been with my in-laws in Hazard in Eastern Kentucky for the week, and we had planned to get her um, return, <laughs> return her home um, that Friday. And um, she called me because there were horrific storms and she's 13 and she is not a dog, so she doesn't get scared, but she was like, it is awful. Please, I, I want, I want to come home. And I'm like, well, you know, it'll be okay. It'll be fine. Um, and what I did not realize at the time was just how much it was going to rain, um, how quickly and how quickly all of the creeks and streams that typically do not flood in central Appalachia would. And I didn't realize it until the next day when we couldn't get a hold of anyone um, to make sure that they were okay because all the infrastructure was down. And so um, this particular disaster hits very close to home for me. I spent 15 years of my life in Hazard um, and much of my extended family is there. And um, I was there over the weekend working on mucking out a house um, and just the sheer level of devastation even two months after the flood is just, it's really hard to describe unless, unless you've been there. Um, but I will say um, in terms of the local and state and federal um, response, we, um, we have a good network of housing providers, um, nonprofits, um, working with extremely low income folks in Eastern Kentucky. Um, we know that about 15,000 folks have applied for FEMA assistance. The average award is um, only around $4,000. And so that has hit folks hard. Um, I think if you are not used to dealing with FEMA, it is, it is kind of a shock to the system um, when you realize how the program is designed. And um, so that has, that has been hard for folks to navigate. Uh, like Florida, we have challenges with mobile homes. Um, you know, the nationwide average of housing units is about 6% um, consisting of mobile homes. In rural Kentucky, it's um, about 20%. We also do have challenges with infrastructure um, and like in Puerto Rico, um, broadband remains an issue. And especially in the wake of the floods, like it just, the storms took out so much of the infrastructure, just normal places you had cell service, you couldn't, couldn't get through. Um, I think the, thing I would like to communicate with everyone is just how incredibly important the work of disaster related housing is um, as we enter in this phase of climate change. Um, we in Kentucky, you know, a few years back, there was the report saying that Kentucky was one of the safer states for climate change. And we know that isn't true. We had tornadoes in December in Western Kentucky. We had catastrophic flooding in July that comes after um, what was catastrophic flooding in March of 2021. And so I think I, I would encourage, the federal government, state governments to really think about housing investments um, that, you know, are flexible so that we can meet the needs of people who are marginalized and um, that we can think about what housing needs to look like moving forward. One of the real shocking things with the widespread flooding in Eastern Kentucky was, um, that 
much of the flooding that happened was not in the traditional floodplain. And so it, it's going to require hard conversations about how we move folks literally to higher ground um, if the floodplain as it's existed for the last 100 years is, is worthless. Um, I will say that our state housing finance agency, Kentucky Housing Corporation, has done a good job in terms of responding um, with a database inventory of affected rental units and um, a place where people can put their units available for rent. Um, unfortunately, they had they kind of learned through baptism by fire um, with the tornadoes in December, but luckily they were able to put those lessons to practice um, with Eastern Kentucky. The other thing I would like to mention is we are working with stakeholders um, to try to get some sort of state uh, disaster housing trust fund program up and running. We, and funded, um, Obviously, this is something that states are going to have to address. Um, you know, we had the tornadoes, we had the floods. Who knows what is coming next? Um, you know, and it will happen in different parts of the Commonwealth. And we want to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place for the state to respond um, quickly in ways that perhaps CDBG. DR cannot or it doesn't isn't on the right time frame, um, and 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 with FEMA and its and its smaller awards, you know. So this is something that we'll be working on, like what they have adopted in Florida. That was very helpful information. Um, but in the meantime, yes, two months out, we still have people living in tents by the side of the road. Um, people are in RVs and um, I, a big fear is that people will go back to homes that are not safe to live in. So with all that said, um, this is what we're, we're seeing from our partners and friends and family members in, in Eastern Kentucky. And we thank NLIC and everyone else on this call for the opportunity to share. Absolutely, Adrian, and I pre I'm heartbroken by what you and so many other Kentuckians are going through and how many needs remain. I really appreciate you joining to share it. I think it um, gives us all the sense of urgency that we need to really redouble efforts and make sure that resources get to all disaster impacted communities, including those really hard hit in Kentucky. So we're with you in the struggle and really appreciate you joining the call today. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left on today's call and want to um, just kind of zip through relatively quickly some important information, uh, especially about the federal resources that are available now. And then um, a little bit more quickly than that, some of the principles that are guiding our work and the top administrative and legislative priorities that we have. And we'll spend more time diving into these on future calls. So first, I'm gonna turn it over to Noah Patton, who is a housing policy analyst at NLHC. He really leads most of our disaster housing recovery work. And he's gonna share some of the federal resources and announcements that are up now. Noah, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Diane. Uh, yeah, just to quickly hop in for the sake of time. Uh, rolling through these federal resources, uh, obviously, uh, looking at both Hurricane Fiona and Hurricane Ian response, uh, FEMA assistance has been approved, uh, first for Puerto Rico for the entire island, uh, and then 16 counties in Florida, as well as the Seminole tribe. Um, you can go to disasterassistance.gov to apply. Uh, an additional uh, point for that would be in Puerto Rico, critical needs assistance has also been approved. Um, that provides uh, immediate assistance of uh, up to $700 uh, for you know, disaster specific needs. Uh, but again, an important point with that would be the application for both 
is the same. So make sure that you are um, fully stating all damages and and um, and so forth when you fill out that application. It's not just for the seven hundred dollars. Um, moving along, uh, we did see a note from ICE stating that it would not be conducting immigration enforcement procedures at shelters or food banks. Uh, the Border Patrol has had a longstanding policy that uh, disaster recovery centers are not uh, are, are safe zones, uh, free from uh, activities from the CBP as well. Uh, or, yeah. And then moving along to HUD, HUD has stated that they're working with PHAs to facilitate housing assistance to, uh, uh, to residents there. And additionally, they, uh, as many folks have said, there's super waivers out uh, providing additional flexibilities for CDBG grantees, uh, housing opportunities for people with AIDS, housing trust fund, and uh, a significant amount of mortgage assistance uh, in line with Fannie Mae as well. Just take the next slide. Cool. Uh, for USDA, talking about uh, food assistance, there is a SNAP waiver in place for Florida, allowing the purchase of hot foods through October 31st. Typically, you can't purchase hot foods with uh, SNAP, but that is now that rule is now waived through the end of October. And additionally, um, Puerto Rico, uh, while not uh, eligible for SNAP, is eligible does have a nutrition assistance program, and uh, a waiver for hot food purchase under that program is in effect through October 9th. So just another five days there. Uh, in, addition, in addition, IRS uh, offering tax relief through February 15th, 2023 for individuals and households affected by in and residing or owning a business in Florida. And then finally, as I alluded to earlier, Fannie Mae does have a variety of mortgage assistance and disaster relief options. Uh, these may include forbearance uh, for payments during the period of disaster recovery. Uh, homeowners and renters can call the number on that slide or visit knowyouroptions.com to find out more information about that. And uh, with that, I'll turn that back over to Diane and then Sarah, perhaps. Yeah, thanks, Noah. We can turn it right over to Sarah to share principles for recovery. Sarah? Absolutely. I, I uh, These are the seven principles that underlie all of the work that we do through the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition. They originated from our partners in Texas, Texas Housers, and we added to it with input directly from our 850 members of the DHRC, including those with firsthand experience recovering after disasters. These are the principles that we use to guide all of our policy work. It's the principles that we think are needed to ensure a complete and equitable recovery and so that we are centering people who have the greatest needs in, in policymaking. I'll, I won't go through each one, but uh, we will be sharing these slides afterwards so that folks can dig into it more, and I'll turn it back to Noah. Hello, uh, coming right back in. Man, that was quick, well done. Uh, for the top DHRC legislative priorities, uh, you know, since we're, just about over time right now, I'll just kind of pick the top ones here. Uh, the first being enact robust CDBGDR or HUD long-term recovery funding and ensure public input and oversight to those um, to ensure that you know community input can guide those long-term recovery funds that um, you know HUD can enforce fair housing law as regards uh, with regards to those funds and so on and so forth. In addition, um, you know, uh, boosting the housing trust fund to replace uh, lost subsidized housing is of exceptional importance as well. Uh, when we do lose subsidized housing, it, it, there's very little replacement. And so that just further uh, uh, worsens the housing crisis in disaster impacted areas. And I can take the next slide. Uh, this is what I was looking for. So first off would be enacting the Reforming Disaster Recovery Act to authorize and reform long-term disaster recovery efforts. Uh, as folks that are long time uh, involved with the DHRC know, uh, the CDBGDR program for HUD is not permanently authorized. Because it is not permanently authorized, there are no concrete 
uh, regulations surrounding the program. Congress must approve funds. They must write regulations and um, you know perform several additional steps that oftentimes can delay uh, long-term recovery funds from reaching those most in need of assistance following a disaster. So there is that bill uh, sponsored by uh, Al Green in the House and uh, Senator Schatz in the Senate. Uh, moving along to the Housing Survivors of Major Disasters Act, the uh, this bill would actually address the title issues that you know we've pretty much heard from all of our panelists today. Uh, it would provide an expanded list of documentation you can use to show you own your own home following a disaster. And then also um, uh, uh, standardize the use of declarative statement forms where you can attest under penalty of perjury that you own your own home. Uh, in addition, it would provide resources for titling uh, after a disaster and um, approve uh, assistance to uh, previous victims of disasters that had their claims denied due to this issue that has now since uh, you know been addressed. Uh, obviously not enough by FEMA. Uh, and then finally, I'll just say enact the um, Disaster Housing Stability Act as well that uh, would prevent evictions during a certain period of time following a disaster as well. And then in just in terms of uh, administrative priorities, I'll just say DHAP and DASH, uh, the Disaster Housing Assistance Program, uh, was a successful program uh, co-administered by FEMA and HUD following disasters that provided uh, portable uh, housing assistance to the lowest income disaster survivors paired with uh, HUD approved housing counseling um, to allow uh, a, a, you know, a more permanent foundation following a disaster to uh, achieve permanent housing, I'll just say. And it was uh, very successfully used following Hurricane Sandy and several uh, disaster responses following that. Uh, however, it has not been approved since 2017, and we have certainly been pushing the administration on that fact. Senator Warren and Representative Espayat actually just sent a letter to FEMA and HUD asking for activation of this program last week. Uh, and then finally, because Diane hasn't popped up to kick me off, I'll also include uh, that we'd love for clarification that individuals experiencing homelessness are fully eligible for the same FEMA assistance as renters. Uh, many people don't know that if you were experiencing homelessness during a disaster, you are actually ineligible for the vast majority of FEMA assistance following that disaster. Uh, and so, you know, oftentimes a disaster will, uh, you know, since disasters impact the most vulnerable folks the most, and um, people experiencing homelessness are perhaps the most vulnerable people in our society today. Doing this would ensure that they have an actual shot at disaster recovery and that a disaster does not just further, um, you know, further their chronic homelessness. So with that, I will wrap it up. Thanks so much. Very good. Thank you, Noah. And thanks, Sarah. We can go to the last slide, please. Um, so we covered a lot of information on this call. I'm so appreciative, again, for all of the community leaders from impacted states that um, joined us today to share the needs uh, on the ground. And uh, we certainly are committed to continuing to listen and work with you towards a just and equitable recovery. We will be having these calls weekly. Um, moving forward, there'll be for an hour each call every Tuesday at 2 p.m. And you can see the registration registration link on um, the screen. There is also a disaster housing recovery working group every Wednesday at two o'clock. That's typically a smaller group with more room for conversation and discussion to work through these issues. And that's um, led by Noah Patton. Also led by NOAA is our uh, DHRC Puerto Rico working group led together with um, many community activists and leaders from Puerto Rico. That's every Thursday at 3 p.m. If you'd like to participate in that, you can email NOAA and there is um, his email address is on the screen. And then just a reminder that we are going to be going back to our national housed campaign calls every other Monday at 2.30, and that next call for the housed campaign 
will be on Monday, October 24th. But please do join us again next Tuesday for our next National Disaster Housing Recovery Call so we can talk in much more depth about the work we have. Clearly, we have so much work to do, but we do have a number, we have made progress that we have to build off of now to hold FEMA accountable to some positive changes and to move forward some already introduced legislation that would have a big impact. I also want to point out to you that we NLHC has a new resource page that was included in the email for registration for this call. And you can check there regularly. We will be updating it with information from the administration, from Congress, any updates related to disaster housing recovery. And you can also check our Friday newsletter, which is called The Connection, which will have a roundup of those updates as well. So lots of ways for you to stay updated and to get involved. And we really welcome your involvement because there is so much work to do. So thank you very much again for joining today. Appreciate you all. Take care and we'll see you again soon. Bye.